This is presentation two of the Outdoor Emergency Care class. We will be talking in detail about the airway and breathing components of the primary assessment. To get to this point, we did our scene size up, so we know that the scene is safe. We've got our standard precautions. We have one patient who was unresponsive with a serious mechanism. We've made our radio call and our resources are coming. Our general impression is of a patient who is unresponsive and seriously injured. We'll be controlling the patient's cervical spine as much as possible. We did not identify any need for a tourniquet or bleeding control, and we are not at the point of doing CPR. So that brings us to airway. And our four steps of airway are open, look, clear, insert. So first we're going to open the airway. Before we can work on the airway in a patient who is in a prone or face down position in the snow, we will need to reposition them while minimizing the movement of their head, neck, and spine. If you have a team of rescuers on scene, you can use the conventional log roll technique, which you will learn later in the OEC course. If you are by yourself, you can use the lone rescuer log roll technique. Open the airway using a jaw thrust. The tongue is the most common cause of airway obstruction in an unconscious patient. Because it is attached to the jaw, the jaw thrust technique will lift the tongue off of the posterior pharynx, allowing air to pass. Brace your hand against the patient's cheeks and use your fingers to lift up on the angle of the jaw. For a patient with a medical cause of collapse and no suspected neck injury, or if the jaw thrust is just not working effectively, you can open the airway using the head tilt chin lift. This video demonstrates the head tilt chin lift. Note that either airway maneuver, the jaw thrust or head tilt chin lift, will need to be held in place to maintain an open airway. Look in the airway. After opening the airway with the jaw thrust or head tilt chin lift maneuver, we also need to open the mouth and look inside. We're looking for fluids like blood or vomitus, or snow or foreign bodies. To open the mouth, use a crossed finger technique. Using your thumb and index finger, or your thumb and middle finger, use the crossed finger technique to open the mouth so that you can see into the mouth and airway. Clear the airway if it is obstructed with fluids or foreign bodies. Immediately and aggressively log roll the patient up onto his or her side and drain the fluids out until suction is available and ready. When a suction unit is available, insert the device and suction while withdrawing it slowly. For the written test, the textbook states that you should suction for no more than 10 to 15 seconds in an adult or 5 to 10 seconds in a child. In reality, you should suction until the airway is clear of blood or vomitus. When I say to do something aggressively, I mean to do it using 100% effort and with the understanding that what you're doing is going to make the difference between saving this person's life or letting them die. So you should do it with maximum intensity and get the job done. And that is how you should practice it in class so you'll be ready when you have to actually do it. So we did open, look, clear, and now we can insert an airway. And we have two choices. For an unresponsive patient with no gag reflex, the airway adjunct of choice is the oropharyngeal airway, or oral airway, or OPA. These come in a variety of different sizes, and it's important to choose the correct size, because it may not work at all, or it may make things worse if you choose the wrong size. We choose one that looks about right, and then measure from the corner of the mouth to the angle of the jaw, or the earlobe, to make sure. In an adult, we insert the oropharyngeal airway upside down and rotate it 180 degrees as it passes the tongue. In a child, we can use a tongue depressor or your gloved fingers to retract the tongue and insert the airway directly. Or we can go in sideways and do a 90 degree twist. The objective in a child is to avoid damage to the roof of the mouth or soft palate where the bones have not finished growing. This is the National Ski Patrol Outdoor Emergency Care Skill Performance Guideline for Inserting an Oropharyngeal Airway. Initiate Standard Precautions. 
Hold the adjunct against the side of the face with the flange adjacent to the corner of the patient's mouth. Size the airway by measuring from the patient's earlobe to the corner of the mouth or from the corner of the mouth to the angle of the jaw. Open the patient's mouth with the cross finger technique. Hold the airway upside down with your other hand. Insert the airway with the tip facing the roof of the mouth and slide it in until it is halfway into the mouth. Rotate the airway 180 degrees. Insert the airway until the flange rests on the patient's lips. For a patient who may have a gag reflex, or if you tried to insert an OPA and found a gag reflex or an increased level of responsiveness, the adjunct of choice is the nasopharyngeal airway, or nasal airway, or NPA, or nasal trumpet, or nose hose. This is great for those patients who maybe are under the influence of a nervous system depressant, such as tequila, and maybe they're on the low end of V into P on the AVPU scale. Maybe they're not really maintaining their airway and they keep snoring or snorting. For the NPA, we measure from the nostril to the earlobe. These come in different lengths and diameters and styles. You want the correct length, but you also want the largest diameter that will fit in the patient's nostril. Some of these also have a length adjustment, so if it's too long, you can slide the slider to adjust it, or you can put a safety pin through one that does not have a slider. In most patients, the right nostril is larger and is a straighter shot. Keep in mind that the airway of the nose goes straight back into the head, not up into the brain. Making sure you have gloves on, lubricate the nasopharyngeal airway. The best way to do this is to put the lube on or in the bag that the NPA came in and use that to apply it to the airway so you don't touch it. Then insert gently into the nostril. The bevel on the tip of the airway is designed to glance off of the structures in the middle of the nose. So if you're inserting it in the right nostril, you're good to go. If the left nostril looks like it will work better, you need to flip the nasopharyngeal airway 180 degrees until you get past the nasal terminates and then rotate to go the rest of the way. The tip of the airway ends up resting in the hypopharynx just above the epiglottis. Once we're done with airway, we can move on to breathing. The first thing we want to know about breathing is, is there breathing? We're going to use the look, listen, and feel that you learned in CPR class. Look for chest rise. Listen for air exchange in your ear and feel for their breath against your face. If there's no breathing, we're going to give rescue breaths with a pocket mask or administer ventilations using a bag valve mask, or BVM, also known as an AMBU bag. Assuming there is breathing, the next thing we want to know is what's the breathing like? We want to know the rate, rhythm, and quality of the breathing. For the rate, we want to know is the breathing too slow, less than 8 breaths a minute? Is it too fast, more than 24 breaths a minute? What's the rhythm of the breathing? Is it regular or is it irregular? Does it keep speeding up and slowing down? Is it gasping or is it just nice and regular? We want to know the quality of the breathing. Is it too shallow or is it excessively deep? If the breathing is at all inadequate in any way, we're going to assist ventilations with the bag valve mask. The next thing under breathing is to check the chest. We want to find any holes in the chest and plug them up so air is not getting in. If there's any major damage to the rib cage or chest wall, we want to identify that and we can assist ventilations with the AMBU bag. When assessing the chest, remember that the back is also part of the chest wall and rib cage. It's also possible to get a wound somewhere lower on the abdomen or elsewhere in the body that extends into the chest cavity. If there's a case report of a construction worker that fell, landed on a piece of rebar, slid off of that, and then fell further. When they found him, he had difficulty breathing and they couldn't figure out why until they took off his underwear and found that the rebar had gone in through his groin, up through his abdomen, and punctured his diaphragm. And that was why he had what was basically a sucking chest wound in his groin. 
so it's important to do a thorough assessment, especially if you can't find a reason for the patient's symptoms. This is a good example of the EC technique finger position for making the face seal with your bag valve mask or AMBU bag. Remembering that you're using those three fingers in the E to pull the face up into the mask more than cramming the mask down onto the face. To ventilate the patient, you should have one or more airway adjuncts already in place to help hold the airway open, holding the tongue off the back of the pharynx. Go ahead and make a good mask seal using the EC finger technique if you've got one rescuer and deliver ventilations looking for chest rise over one second, approximately every five to six seconds. Again, checking the chest for wounds and damage, any open wounds that we find, we wanna seal with an occlusive dressing. The textbook says to tape the dressing on three sides and you may see that as a test question. However, that may not be effective in reality. So you can go ahead and seal the wound just check it frequently, and if any air pressure builds up, you can let it out by burping the dressing. And the last of our four steps of breathing is administer oxygen. We want to think about our assessment thus far, how serious we think the patient is, how much supplemental oxygen they're going to need. We're going to talk in detail about oxygen administration in a separate presentation.